Hi, I'm Janet Deneef, founder and director of the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. You are about to hear one of our highlight conversations recorded live for our 2022 festival, which explored the role of the written word in upholding humanity's values and freedoms through our festival theme, Mamayu Hayuning Bawana, Uniting Humanity. So please settle in and let the magic of our 19th festival continue. Hello everyone, my name is Mirandi Rewo, I'm an Australian author um, and here today we're to talk to these three speculative fiction authors. Um, so I'm going to tell you about them each first and then we'll get into our questions. So Sequoia Nagamatsu here on my right is the author of the novel How High We Go in the Dark and the story collection Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone. He has been shortlisted for the Waterstones Debut Fiction Prize, the Ursula K. Le Guin Prize, and the Barnes & Noble Discover Prize, as well as long list inclusion for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. He teaches creative writing at St. Olaf College and the Rainier Writing Workshop Low Residency MFA Program and lives in Minneapolis. Welcome, all the way from America. <laughs> And Norman, who we have on the screen. Thank you, Norman. Norman Erickson Pasaribu's first short story collection was Hanya Kamu Yang Tau Burapa Lama Lagiaku Harus Memangu, which is uh, um, Only You Know How Much Longer I Should Wait. I'm sorry for that, Norman. And their debut poetry collection, Sergius Manchari Bacchus. Sergius Seeks Bacchus, won the 215 Jakarta Arts Council Poetry Competition and was named by Tempo as one of the best poetry collections of that year. Their short story collection, Happy Stories, mostly won... The, story, the stories are called Happy Stories Mostly, won the 2022 Republic of Consciousness Prize and was long listed for the 2022 Interna International Booker Prize. So he's a bit fancy. <laughs> Congratulations, Norman. Laura Jean McKay is also very fancy. She's the author of The Animals in That Country, winner of the Arthur C. Clarke Award, the Victorian Prize for Literature, an Australian Book Industry Award, and co-winner of an Aurelis, Aurelis Award for Best Science Fiction Novel. She was awarded the New Zealand, is it? NZ is South Australia? New what is it? Yeah. New Zealand yeah. Waitangi Day Literary Honours in 2022. Laura is also the author of Holiday in Cambodia. Her forthcoming collection, Gunflower, will be released with Scribe in 2023. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. So today on this panel, we're going to explore the power of speculative fiction to educate and influence our behaviour by ultimately posing the what if question. So I'm going to pose this what if question to each of you now. I'm gonna start with Laura. So Laura's book is The Animals in That Country. So this is a synopsis of the book. We've got hard drinking, foul mouthed and allergic to bullshit Jean. And she's not your usual grandma. She's never been good at getting, at, um, getting along with other humans apart from her beloved granddaughter, Kimberly. As disturbing news arrives of a pandemic sweeping the country, Jean realises this is no ordinary flu. Its chief symptom is that its victims begin to understand the language of animals. First mammals, then birds and insects too. As the flu progresses, the unstoppable voices become overwhelming and many people begin to lose their minds. As the Australian Book Review writes, this is an absorbing and affecting book and one to which I'm able to pay the highest compliment that in the days after finishing it, the world felt different to me. It's animals not speaking, but not silent either. So Laura, one of its many strengths is, like I originally read it a couple of years ago when it came out, and it just stayed with me really vividly over that time, and it was, a really, it was just such a pleasure to revisit Jean and Sue. Um, can you tell us about how you had the idea for the animals in that country, how it came about, and what was the what-if moment for you? Like, why spec fic for what you want to express? Thank you. Thanks for that beautiful introduction, Mirandi, and so nice to see you all here. Uh, 
So I had a number of, of animal encounters. Um, when I was starting to conceive of the idea of this book, um, I'd started to think, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if, if we finally knew what other animals were saying? Uh, the cats in our lives, fish, uh, you know, the, the lizards that you see crawling along, and then eventually insects. And as I was starting to think about this, I was actually on a residency in Australia in the bush. And there was this very dark path on, on the way to the car and I was on my way out there one night and I came face to face with a full-size kangaroo. And if anyone hasn't encountered a kangaroo, a big male kangaroo, you know, they are the height of me. And I should have been quite scared because he was by himself, he was without his pack. So apparently, you know, they can, when they're rogue like that, they're, they're feeling anxious, um, they're feeling sad, you know, they can be violent. And we just stood there staring at each other and then I sort of went, tried to go one way and he went the same way and, <laughs> and I went the other way and he went the same, you know, we were being very polite to each other when you're trying to get in the door of a restaurant, you know. And, uh, and then we, we just passed each other very, very benevolently and I just thought, I just had this really lovely exchange with a member of another species. If that had been a human man on a dark path in the bush at night, I either would have been running the other direction or I would have had my keys out, right? <laughs> um, but it was, it was a really beautiful yeah, exchange and I thought, well, what would happen if, if the language barrier was taken away? What more could we say to each other in that moment? And in the days after, he hung around the, ca the couch. I hung around the couch. <laughs> he was outside eating grass. You don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we think maybe he was sick and then uh, eventually Aww. he wandered off. So that, that really struck something in me. And I think that moment, um, and there were a lot of other encounters, you know, that I've had that haven't been so, so easy, but that moment is in every animal I write in the animals in that country, that, that moment of... of hairy and skin exchange where you're going, w w I don't understand you, but, but I know you and I'm okay with you. It's really mm. exciting. That's lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Okay, so ne next I'm gonna tell you about Sequoia's book. In How High We Go in the Dark, it's 2030, and a grieving archeologist arrives in the Arctic Circle to continue the work of his recently deceased daughter at the Badagaika Crater, where researchers are studying long buried secrets now revealed in melting permafrost including the perfectly preserved remains of a girl who appears to have died of an ancient virus. Once unleashed, the Arctic plague will reshape life on Earth for generations to come. This is a spellbinding and profoundly prescient debut that follows a cast of intricately linked characters over hundreds of years as humanity struggles to rebuild itself in the aftermath of a climate plague. As the review in The Guardian describes it, how High We Go in the Dark is a truly genre-transcending work in which sense of wonder and literary acumen are given boundless opportunity to shine. So, Sequoia, your book covers time, the climate, a plague, science, outer space, many, many things. But for me, it actually is about human connection and life and death. What made you originally think of tackling these questions in um, speculative fiction? Like, what was your what-if moment? Well, I mean, the seeds of the novel began um, almost 10 years ago um, when I was grieving the loss of my own grandfather. And I was living in Tokyo at the time um, and just traveling around Japan generally. And I found myself um, fascinated uh, in part because of a college class I took on the culture of death. And in thinking about that course, I found myself at a mortuary expo in Tokyo. Oh, wow. So it was me and a bunch of senior citizens um, <laughs> looking at caskets and various other sort of alternative ways to, to um, say goodbye, to honor yourself, to allow different means of your family to say, you know, say their farewells. And um, in, in a place like Tokyo, there's a space issue, and there's obviously financial considerations around the world about funerals and, and medical expenses. So there are funerary skyscrapers in my novel, and those mm. exist in some ways in, in mm. Japan. Um, there are communal urns where entire neighborhoods right. might be interred together um, you know, as, as a bonding experience, but also a cost-saving measure, mm. and this also occurs in, in parts of Japan as well. 
And so for me, the speculative isn't so much about the what if, and the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein is kind of you know, famously quoted as, as saying, well, science fiction, speculative fiction is about what if, if only, um, you know, what could, what, what could have been. And we're living in an age now, and we have been for quite some time, where the if isn't really a question. Climate change oh, is yeah. happening, yeah. right? Mm. Um, you know, there are a lot of things coming in our future that is um, not speculative at all. Mm -mm -mm. So for me, the question is, how will we overcome? And if that's not possible, how will we adapt? And I think the biggest question of all that my novel attempts to tackle is how can we reimagine a better version of ourselves mm -hmm. where we actually have the capacity to allow for empathy and understanding each other. That's probably the most fictional part of my novel is that most of my characters are genuinely good people mm. and, <laughs> and, are, and, and allow for community. Mm. Governments are working together. Like in the later chapters of the novel, we see that there are international efforts um, to stave off climate change. They're shooting mm -hmm. off these mm -hmm. solar flower, flyer satellites that are reflecting sunlight back into space. Japan is building seawalls, very large seawalls. And, you know, I teach a climate fiction class, you know, as a professor, and my students often are, I think, a little dispirited by the end of the semester because mm -hmm. We are covering technology, we're covering all of these ways that we could save ourselves. Technology is rarely the problem. Mm. The biggest problem really is, is us and this question of, of connectivity. Um, so I think if there is a buzzword that's attached to my novel, you know, and in answering your question on, on the speculative, it's possibility, the possibility mm. to become better, the possibility yeah. to allow for other versions of ourselves, okay. the possibility to think about um, who our ancestors were mm. and um, what and how we exist in connection to people that we've lost. Mm -hmm. So there are chapters that, where this actually happens in very concrete ways where you are in a kind of otherworldly void and you're able to experience the memories of other people mm -hmm. by walking into these glowing mm -hmm. orbs. Mm -hmm. All of these comatose patients are able to actually literally step into each other's shoes mm -hmm. and through that way are able to actually find a kind of weird community mm -hmm. in, in this darkness. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful book. So Norman, welcome Norman. <laughs> So, to tell you about Norman's book, I stole from the judges page on the fancy International Booker Prize site. Happy Stories Mostly, translated into English by Tiffany Sow, is a powerful blend of science fiction, absurdism and al alternatively historical realism that aims to destabilise the heteronormative world and expose its underlying rot. Inspired by Simone Weil's concept of decreation, and drawing on Batak and Christian cultural element, this book puts queer characters in situations and plots conventionally filled by hetero characters. So Norman, your book is full of short stories that have a real sense of the ridiculous, but also they engage with very serious ideas. And I noticed that even the more speculative fiction stories engage with themes to do with religion and post-colonialism. In what way do you find writing, you know, the absurd or speculatively allows for a useful perspective to reflect upon such important contemporary or even historical ideas? How do you come across these what-if moments in your fiction? Uh, actually, Ooh. I, I have been, like, interested in, like, queer history from, like, long ago because my mm -hmm. book of poems also revolves around uh, the history of queerness in Christian culture. So how to say, like, I, like in my, like in Batak people, like more than 50% of Batak people today are Christians. So, and we are, it, it is the result of like the German mission and mm. also the Dutch colonialism. Mm. But then 
uh, how to say there is I feel there is a gap between what happened in the past and what what is we are today because Batak people treat these missions kind of like how to say they, they, they are they are happy about it so they don't have any critique about it they don't they don't feel for example there is a dark side of the mission for example so uh how to say and then for example batak people today always think for example like people shouldn't be gay so mm. even though like in the past uh in many parts of Indonesia, including in the in the Tapanuli people, actually uh, have a more complex, more sophisticated views about gender and sexual orientation. And then many of this, how to say, like many of these wisdoms, knowledge are gone because of the war, because of the the occupation. And so, right, yeah. uh, how to say? So it's kind of like. The what if is uh, try to remember a memory that is like has been erased. Like try just to reclaim what it's not uh, how to say physically there anymore. Right. Because uh, Batak people today we don't we don't have many many for example uh, like the written documents of our culture. Even uh, our artifacts mostly are. Up in Europe, in in Netherlands or or in Germany. Yeah, yeah. So all of this, uh, how to say, I I I, I kind of I kind of feel all of these inaccessible things will become accessible with fiction because basically you can do anything in fiction. You can in fan, you can uh, change. So I feel like it is the purpose of these changes and invention and then creation that that matters so right. the, my purpose is to resist the legacy of colonialism in like for Batak people for my people something like that yes lovely thank you and that's where your decreate the decreation the idea of decreation comes from in your work yeah also yeah and I suffer a lot so just want <laughs> to play it okay um, so my next question, and I feel sorry, Sequoia, like you've answered this in a, in a way, but my next question is to do with how you, as writers, see our future and how you choose to depict our future. Um, and is it with hope or pessimism? Norman, I might go with you first this time. I get the sense that although you are critiquing and questioning the state of our world in your stories, there are like moments of hope, like real hope. For example, in one of your stories set in the future, the character is reminded of a pride march she attended years before in Indonesia. And I, as far as I could find, there's never been a pride march here. Um, and when you write, do you, do you mean for your fiction to be prophecy or hopeful or perhaps even like modelling a better future for readers, like modelling it? Uh, no. No. <laughs> oh. uh, I, uh, how to say, for me, honestly, even writing is an act of hope because yeah. you're still writing because you are still having hope. Like if you're hopeless, yeah. why, why the hell write? Um, but I don't know how to say. My purpose is not to imagine like better future because I feel like so many things on the equation. Right, yes. So just, it's just how to say, I don't know. So rather than rather than imagining a better future, I would like just imagining better, weirder, stranger reality. Mm -hmm. So it, it has, personally, it has, how to say, yeah. So there's hope in that, even though... Yeah, so it's better like trying to, how to say, like, just to put around all of different kinds of perspective and then possibilities mm. and, uh, becoming like futuristic hopeful something like that yes. because many things on the equation and then I feel like well I'm just a writer so it's, yeah. writers are very important <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I think I think I like that yeah 
Laura, your novel is a comment on many things, but mostly perhaps our treatment of animals and the environment. In your novel, animals refer to humans as it, a reversal of how we talk of animals, and you have recategorized animals' strengths as a way from, you know, like just milk or meat produce. Do you think fiction or speculative fiction has a role in modeling, again, how we could be living more ethically or kindly? Mm. Uh, I, th I mean, I'm, I'm certainly in the, in the camp of, of thinking that, um, that humans are pretty terrible. <laughs> um, I'm very, very uh, cynical about, about our species' um, capacity to um, do, do, do better in the world. We seem to, we seem to sort of stay, do as, as good as we must and then, and then stagnate a little. And I think that's why we find ourselves in the global position that we're in. But... Um, reluctantly, there is a very, very hopeful aspect <laughs> in, in my novel. And, and of course I have hope because that's also something that humans have. Um, we're very, very adaptable and, and we, we do hope for better things, even if we can't quite manage it all, all the time. And in this novel, I write a lot about animal presence, which, you know, the, the animals are very much there and increasingly as, they, as they, uh, the humans understand what they're saying, the animals, the animals become more and more present in the novel, um, more and more um, active. Um, they, they, you see their agency and you see their power. Uh, and that's actually quite a speculative thing because we are living in a time of, of mass extinction. Um, so something I was very much avoiding uh, by writing Animal Presence, that was my human hope, hoping that they will stay with us because they're, they're overcome, not overcome overcome what we're doing. overcome what we're doing and australia has the dubious honor of um, having one of the highest extinction rates mm. in the world um, you know and the animals as 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 with indonesia as well are, are very unique and, and very special and and they're not really there anymore um, and so we come to a time where we go to zoos <laughs> to see um, these rare and wonderful things, and that is the only animal presence that we have. So, um, yeah, there is, there, it is partly my love letter to the animal world um, saying, you know, I see you, hold I on. remember you, hold on, hold even on. though I, I think really, ultimately. <laughs> no, um, you're hopeful, Laura. <laughs> no, sorry, hopeful. I'm very hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Sequoia, this, this does speak a bit to what you were saying, though. I read your beautiful book that begins in the nearish future is mostly hopeful. Although there... And even in this future, there's animal testing, there's joblessness, there's a comment that life is always easier for boys, like this is still going on in the future. There's also... Um, but there's also still culture and humanity and a, and a cure. And to quote my favourite quote, the post-apocalypse doesn't mean we stop dancing. A lot of that. Would you say, so, and you've already said your novel is about what's possible. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I also am holding on to hope with a giant asterisk <laughs> next, next to the word right, hope. Right, yeah. Um, and I think because, you know, what's the point if you've, if you've lost hope? Mm. Um, and so I choose to sort of see speculative fiction and this novel as essentially, I was kind of speaking to Norman, what Norman said here earlier about strangeness, um, as different way, different lenses to view who we are and how we behave, whether that's through um, a robotic dog that's a vessel for a dead mother's voice mm, and lullabies, mm, mm, mm. whether that's through a telepathic pig that is able to give catharsis to a grieving father who lost his son and is growing hearts in this pig mm. to donate to mm. other children. Mm. And this pig understands that mm. sacrifice. Mm. Uh, whether it's through this void I talked about or a, a generation starship mm. in search of a new home where mm. a new kind of community is formed through the cosmos knowing that everything that they've left behind on Earth is thousands of years gone. Mm. Um, and so all of these things are so far removed from our current reality, and yet the fundamental part of who we are as humans, loss, heartache, unrequited love, familial estrangement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all still remain. Yep. And I think it's because you're looking at these things at a glance askew, you're 
I think I, my hope is that readers and even myself as a writer will be better able to articulate or at least to sense, you know, um, what is it about this feeling or was it, what is it about this moment that I can't explain any other way other than through storytelling or mm -hmm. through art. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Laura, as a writer of historical fiction myself, I, um, I'm interested in research and this quote that I found from your, um, from an interview with you, if you're writing, you're also researching. In the period of this book's creation, the effects of climate change have intensified. Politics polarised, species extinction escalated, and social media became news. The, uh, these dramatic shifts permeate any imagined world. It's no wonder this and other books that are coming out are dystopian. We reflect what's around us even if we don't intend to. So can you tell me about research, particularly for this book? Mm. Yeah. I wish that quote must have been edited because I never speak that articul <laughs> articulately out loud. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, so I, I was lucky enough to get into a PhD program in Australia um, as part of researching this book. And I'm glad I did because I really needed all the help that I could get. Um, it took seven years in the writing and that was through, you know, much, much support. Um, I, and that's because I was, I was writing two novels, really. I was writing a gritty realist fiction about a woman who likes her drink and her smokes and her cars and, and finds it a bit hard to get along with humans but likes to talk to dingoes. And then a speculative fiction novel um, where um, we are finally able to communicate with other animals. Um, and part of the research into that took me up into the Northern Territory uh, where I was an artist in residence on a wildlife park. And uh, that place just really transformed everything because I was, in a way, I, become, I became one of the animals in the enclosure. I was living in this tiny caravan um, surrounded by pythons <laughs> um, every day on my path to the bathroom. There was a, there was a three metre olive python sitting over the... Um, the path and, and she was just sunning herself and so I couldn't go to the bathroom between two and four every day. Uh, so I, I found myself um, in this place where I felt quite enclosed and I was in a place where there were a lot of captive animals but there were often their wild counterparts um, flying around and running around. So at night I would hear the barking owls which sort of have a hoof hoof sound. Um, people from the Northern Territory would, would know that in their enclosures calling out to their wild counterparts over the top. So I was, I was experienced this, experiencing this double sort of research, um, which I think is partly what fiction writing is about, where you're really trying to mm. sort of contain something mm. and you're trying to write about this, this very constricted world, but at the same time you're sort of open to mm. these wild possibilities that, mm. are, that are zooming around overhead. So with all the bookish research and I, I was doing and all the <laughs> academic sentences mm. I was writing, I was also just staring at animals mm. and, um, yeah, and, and experiencing, yeah, the power of Probably. them. Yeah. Sequoia, in How High We Go in the Dark, you centre Asian and uh, Asian American characters, which, which, like, so I'm Asian Australian, I really loved it, but, and I thought, but it was weird that I noticed and appreciated it because it, could, it shouldn't be that way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I feel um, like it stands out. I wrote, so at the beginning of the, I think you've talked about this too, at the beginning of COVID, I had a book come out that was about the Chinese and the gold rush in Australia, and it came out in March, and I thought, oh, what terrible timing, because it was at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, this virus had come out of China. I thought, you know, just when you're trying to build empathy or talk about racism, all this sort of happened. And a friend of mine said, oh, no, maybe it's good timing, mm -hmm. you know, because... And then we saw all the terrible, like, sort of the, that hate right. and the um, violence against Asians during COVID. Um, so I was, I was wondering about your work, about mm -hmm. um, how you f feel about like writing your Asian characters. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, my, my book sold in the early days of COVID and, mm. and my agent, you know, when you're a writer, you work on a book for, for years and, yes. and you're kind of just waiting for your agent to tell you, 
we're ready to go out in submission with this. And she told me this in March. And so I was like, oh my God, there's a plague in this. Mm. You know, mm. um, will editors even want mm. it? Mm. Um, but I also realized that it was op an opportunity in my revisions to really make sure that certain things stood out. Um, and, and, and certainly um, the fact that almost all of my characters are Asian, um, you know, Japanese or Japanese nationals. And they're, their race, their, their, their nationality wasn't the point. Mm, mm. And um, for a long time, that was the only kind of literature that you could find by people of color. Mm. It was very othering. Mm. Um, it was you know, for, for you know, a white audience. Mm. Um, and even, even, if, even if the story wasn't exactly the author's own story to tell. So you know, mm -hmm. my grandfather, oh, yeah was in a World War II internment camp um, during, you know, during the World War II. And um, so that's not my story. Like, I, I, I nod to it a little bit in one chapter, but I'm never going to write a, a, an internment camp story because that's not my story. Um, I'm third generation Japanese American, mm -hmm. so the immigrant story isn't necessarily my story to tell as well. So I was always wanting to tell a story of just people who had my experience mm -hmm. or, or some kind of experience like that where you have an Asian face, an Asian body, and you're navigating spaces in a way that's juggling those identities. Um, there's a character in one chapter named Dennis who says that he's a bad Asian. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and I kind of, sometimes I, I sort of like, yeah, I feel like that way too because mm -hmm. it wasn't until relatively late in my life, like after college, where I really sought out, um, I think, my own heritage mm. and started volunteering at sort of Asian arts organizations and really trying to understand, um, you know, the Japanese American and this Asian diaspora at large in America. Um, I think before that, I, I really distanced myself from my Asianness, right. just, I guess, a weird assimilation, mm. but I felt like because I didn't have any media to consume, I didn't think it was okay. I didn't think my own Asianness was okay, um, you know. And it wasn't until very recently that we started seeing more books that featured Asian stories or just POC stories on their own terms. Mm. We're seeing it more in film and television. Um, so there's definitely a sea change. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think both on the author side and on the, and on the publishing side, there's an effort to address something that has been missing for for so long and. I wanted my novel to be a part of that mm. conversation, um, not only for readers in general, but mm. for, I think, especially other Asian readers mm. um, who might have wanted more of those stories themselves. Yeah, but it's just fiction. It's not like it's about mm -hmm. their right. Asian-ness. Yeah. It, they're just, exactly. it's just stories like other stories. Exactly. And they happen to be And And Japanese. they're just people surviving like That's anybody right. else, yeah. you know, suffering yeah. from this plague, mm. um, trying to find connections. Mm. And I remember telling my agent um, that I don't want this marketed as, as yeah. an Asian novel. Yep. It's yeah. not an Asian novel. No. You know, just, just, you know, whatever you do, don't, don't make that the point mm. of the marketing campaign. Mm. No. Yeah. Okay, I love it. Okay, so Norman, so I just wanted to discuss with you um, your stories as part of a queer space. Like, do you find speculative fiction a place that you can create and explore ideas of queerness in this, in a, you know, a world of restrictions? Uh, like fiction and spec fiction? No, both. I mean, yes, of course, because like, mm. like I said, uh, the, the speculative fictions allow you to the stabilized reality that, that you are in and then you just how to say you can shake things up mm -hmm. basically and then um you can also like i i i wrote a speculative history short story in the book about the tale of the giant uh, yes in the, yes yeah in the north sumatra and then yes some people ask if it's if it's <laughs> like that's a great story Fairy and I said it's a fictional <laughs> fairy tale, somehow fictional folklore. <laughs> so yeah, because I I'm I kind of like obsessed with the idea of story within story within story. It has been there since the beginning of my work. So I feel like with this kind of how to say, let's say 
structure game. Mm. Uh, you can actually deconstruct the structure, the social mm. structure. Mm. Then also I feel because I I write I often I not often I most of the time write in a, in a more comedic tone. Right. I feel. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like a, as a I, uh, like humor is it works similarly with speculative, with horror, with sci-fi. It, it 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 can be used to challenge something that people can't challenge. Mm -hmm. Basically, in Indonesia, it is for example, if you write a short story about God, you people might might hate you if you say something not yeah not religious, for example. So I made a story about like heaven as an office, and then God is the this is the boss that never uh, like never went to the office while everyone mm. just <laughs> around their, like like archiving prayers and then scream mm. something like that and then this kind of how to say this kind of speculative notes allow me to. Uh, challenge the the idea how we perceive uh, God in in our yeah. lives because in Indonesian it's like basically everyone is religious so I feel like but uh, I feel like there there are there needs to be more discussions about how our faith might interfere other person's life like other like like yeah. people that is outside us so yeah. Yeah, I think speculative fictions uh, give me the the license to criticize that because if I if I how to say, for example, if I write about uh, like in a in the like more realist way, mm. and I want to, I want to make for example, oh my character will go to uh, a pride parade, but it's not there in Jakarta mm. like a big yeah yeah yeah. Have, so, exactly. but then with a more speculative fiction, yes, with, with exactly. basic, it yeah. can be done. So yeah, it, it's very usual way to to resist, basically. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what I find fun but tedious as well, but very interesting, is making up a title for your book. Um, which often you come up with something and your publisher says no, and then you say something else and they say no, and then you ask all your friends, and it's, it's fun and, and tedious. Can you each tell us about why you have chosen your titles? Norman, can we start with you? Happy Stories Mostly. How did you come up with yeah. that title? Tell us about it. So initially it came, so I, Happy Stories Mostly is my second book, and then a, a, like a Goodreads reviewer kind of like reviewed my first book and said, this should be retitled into stories of people in suffering. <laughs> but then, I mean, it's funny like how, how for queer people it is oppression and then for hetero readers it's suffering. So it's kind of like <laughs> different kind of way to what happened in, in our life as wow. queer. So okay. yeah, I, I kind of like, so many of, of my writing came up from annoyance, like I feel annoyed with things and I wrote about it. So basically I want to write something that is kind of, how to say, uh, use the word happy, like the word bahagia, mm -hmm. but then uh, the, how to say, the more, the, the older I, I get, I, I, I feel this sense of like, Almostness, hampir, hampir is almost in Indonesian, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how it is just a one word, one letter away from vampire, from vampire. So I imagine uh, happiness, the idea of being happy, the idea of having to be happy is kind of like, like a blood sucking demon or queer. And mm. then with the how to say in social media, everyone seems happy, and then mm. you in a queer, I see all of my straight fans having kids, family, and then. It's it's not something that uh, I can access now as a queer person in Indonesia. So I feel like I want to explore more about this hampir, about this almostness, about the idea of so nearing like in, on the edge of happiness, but you just cannot get in because you don't have the key. 
right. some, something like that. So yeah, uh, that's how the Indonesian title cerita cerita bahagia hampir seluruhnya came, and then uh -huh. uh, maybe it should be translated more as like happy stories, most of them because. But then if you so if you play with the kind of like word games like if, if you read it like happy stories cerita cerita bahagia hampir it means happy stories mostly yeah, yeah. but then the whole is it means becomes most of them so it's just i i choose to just translate the hampir uh, i mean i just because i tiffany asked me from like what from this title and then i just just happy stories mostly is something like that because i feel like it is more more fun to the ears and yes. Tiffany's done a brilliant job translating it. If I... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great title. Um, Sequoia, your title, like I have a hard time remembering my own titles, mm -hmm. let alone um, how high we might go in the dark. Yeah. How did you come with... Um, it's a great title. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my first book, a story collection, was Where We Go and All We Were Is Gone. Yes. So... I guess I'm fond of I would long, not be able to tell anyone what my I'm book long, was called if long that was titles mine. and and <laughs> um, having been published by uh, Harper Collins um, I think there was a there's a very brief conversation about having a more commercial title like a one I bet word there like was. the 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 plague I don't know the yeah, something yeah, yeah. you know yeah. something that's easily becomes plague. like a harsh hashtag for Instagram yeah. or something but um, I, I I think I I stood by the title because it, it really kind of spoke to the philosophical sort of the themes in the book of just mm. reaching for something that's beyond mm. uh, reaching like for a better yeah better yeah. version for and there's a chapter yeah. um, in the book that initially was titled that um. and it was a standalone story years ago uh -huh. um, and you know in this chapter people are literally going high in the dark they're building this impossibly large human pyram pyramid to try to attempt to escape this void, uh, this dark void, um, to save this baby that they've found in there um, because this baby floats off. And, and um, <laughs> it's a strange bug. It's, um, it's magnificent. And, and you know, it, it just made sense that, you know, um, well, I can just title that chapter something else. This is the perfect title for, for the book at large yeah. and what every character is trying to do, that every character is in a dark spot and is trying to crawl out of it in some way. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are, are successful, some of them less so. But I think every character in the book um, is, actually, is, is at least asking questions um, that allows them to know themselves better, even if it means they're facing the reality that maybe, you know, they're, maybe they're not a great person. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Thank you. Laura, the animals in this country. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that title? Yeah, it's it's the title of uh, a Margaret Atwood uh, poetry collection from the 70s, and I, I didn't know it was a collection. I just came across the individual poem when I was I was doing research, um, and I love Margaret Atwood's poetry. I don't think it's very well known, <laughs> but it's really beautiful, mm. and. Um, and one of the, the, the lines in it is, the animals in that country have the faces of people. And then later on in the poem, um, she writes, the animals in that country have the faces of animals. And I really, because I was looking at, at um, anthropomorphism, which is when we project human traits onto, onto um, gods, objects, or animals, I was looking at that a lot. And I love the idea that, that these animals have the faces of people, that we project this onto them um, and then later on um, they as we come to know them we realize that they have their own thing going on that's mm. very very different mm. to to what we project yeah so i um no, i love that that was, that was that how title. it came about yeah yeah <laughs> thank you laura now listen i think we're yes we're at the stage where we are throwing to audience questions um is there anybody here who would like to ask a question? I don't see a microphone. Oh, there is a microphone. The fellow behind you. Let's start with you. Hello. Um, my question is, is there any 
common ingredient that you would have in each of your stories? Something which in all of your writing is just an ingredient that you have to include. Is this for all of us? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, mm. Common ingredient. Norman, do you have a common ingredient for all your stories in your writing? Uh, Sorry, it was, a, it was an audience question. Yes, a, a common ingredient, like something that you always no, find yeah, in your... My, yeah. yeah. You find in I your just, work. I, yeah, I think my main ingredient is annoyance. I oh, annoyance. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anything that annoys me, yes. basically. I, I feel that. like pretty much my writing is just a response to, to basically what is like around me. Oh my gosh. I can very much identify with that. Thank you, Norman. <laughs> Laura? Uh, I'd say relationships uh, are in everything I write, but also I write about power. I'm really interested in power. Power is seen as as a really negative thing often, but I, you know, I love or I'm fascinated about the way that you know, we're sitting up here on the stage and, and people are sitting down here. In, in some cultures, you would be sitting in a circle. Um, there, there's different little power sort dynamics, of yeah. dynamics and imbalances depending on you know, who is speaking and, and who is interacting. And that utterly fascinates me. And so everything I write is about that. And when, when it comes to human and non-human relationships, of course, there's such a big power imbalance and it was my job to sort of shove the human to the side and just let, let the animals just step forward a little. I think as, as an environmental sort of awareness plan, that's, that's sort of my general idea as well. Like the way I write is the way I think that maybe we should be in the world. Just step aside a little and let yeah. everything else come forward. Mm. Uh, for me, um I'm not a happy writer. Like my, my stories usually end in hope or, or kind of a bittersweetness. But but my stories usually begin with broken people, <laughs> right? Um, in some way, um, like especially like familial estrangement um, and then inability to love or love themselves. Um, beyond that, I would say pop culture is um, especially music and film um, is is in almost every one of of my works. Um, actually, I had a little bit of a thing with my editor um, with this book um, until I kind of, t you know, sadly took out most of the references, but I'm a big Nicolas Cage fan. <laughs> um, and so she was like, what's up with all of these Nicolas Cage movie references? <laughs> and it's like, will, will people still be talking about Nicolas Cage in like 2780, 2080? And like, well, my answer is yes. <laughs> um, but, but her answer was no. So, so the, the, some of these movie references uh, you know, came out, but there's a chapter in the book that's all about music. Like two, the two, mm. two of the primary characters are just sharing, um, you know, a playlist, and and they kind of form a bond, um, you know, through music. And it's this relationship between this researcher and this dying patient. But you know, when they're listening to music, they're kind of pressing pause mm. on 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 the world and just kind of allowing themselves to be. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, this one. I, oh, there's a couple. Oh, hi. My question is, um, why is research important in writing speculative fiction, and how much of your research actually goes into your stories? Thank you. Oh, um, it's cool. Let's sure. start. Sure. Um, I mean, I think research is very important because I think. Um, a lot of the people that tend to read speculative fiction, especially uh, those readers that are coming from like the harder science fiction communities, are are sticklers for facts. <laughs> they, they 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 will pay attention to um, you know whether or not your spaceship is <laughs> traveling the right you know speed or like how long it's going to take to get this planet. And I remember there was a Goodreads review, and I really love this reviewer because mm -hmm. they actually recognized that I took the time to research what color the plants might be on this other planet if the planet had a particular kind of star. And um, that took me, you know, like I spent a, probably a couple of months researching this one chapter on, on space exploration. Wow. And I was glad to email astronomers and astrophysicists um, and, and, you know, watch Star Trek. <laughs> but, um, and I almost wore my, wore a kind of a nerdy t-shirt 
Um, I'm sad I didn't, but um, I didn't have time to iron it. I'm, that's another thing that I'm kind of obsessed about is, <laughs> is ironing my clothes. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, like one, you have to think about who your audience might be in terms of that research. Two, I think for the writer, it's important to feel like you have that confidence to write that speculative story to inhabit that world in a believable-ish enough way. Um, but I always, I think, depending on the kind of research, I try to kind of give myself an out. I like to kind of you know, embrace that possibility. So if there's a scientific theory that says, okay, so this might be true, this might be possible within the realm of physics, but it's probably never gonna be proven wrong in my lifetime, I'm like, perfect. <laughs> like, I, cause I, I, I don't want a reader like the next year saying, well, this book's already out of date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of looking for the really far out theories that are kind of, you know, playing with something there. Um, as far as how much research makes it into my book, um, you know, I, I, I wrote this over the period of like on and off over 10 years. Um, and, you know, through that, you know, I, I went to conferences, I, I, I talked to scientists, um, I worked with my colleagues in other departments in chemistry. Um, I would say about 10% <laughs> goes, into, into, goes into the actual book. And I think that's kind of true for, for a lot of writing where you know, you, what you know about your characters and what you know about your world is always going to be much, much more than what actually makes it onto the page. Great. Uh, Laura? Uh, I, I remember someone asking me when I was, I was starting to write this book, oh, which animal are you writing about? And I just said, all of them. Mm. <laughs> and um, not only does that make a rather crowded <laughs> cast, but it's impossible to you know, thoroughly research um, every, every different species. So uh, even though I did do a lot of research, um, and I think that authors should, they should also do just as much as they need because there's the danger of, of saying, I'm researching and you can just research forever and ever and it's never going to be enough or never going to be good enough um, you know, to make it into your, your mm. brilliant world-changing novel. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess I just, I would look for, I guess what I would call um, animal superpowers or, or little, little things that I would find fascinating and just run with that. Like I found out that way back in the day, um, whales actually, you know, in another sort of form, came out of the oceans and walked around on Earth for quite a long time. And after a while of walking around, they, they sort of went, it's not enough food here, <laughs> it's hot, it's dry, you know, this is really awkward. And with their strange little legs, went back into the oceans and became the whales we know. Um, and that was enough for me to, to you know, um, create a, a world that really sort of fueled the novel, really. Mm. Norman, did you want to answer that about research? Uh, I think my process was more like, how to say, like, I just like to read, uh, for example, things about the Dutch history in Indonesia. And mm. then I, after reading, for example, four years, I kind of like made a fiction about it rather than I want to write something and then right, do research. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then even like, for example, the short story Metaksu in the book is talking about memory. And then in my early 20s, I just reading all of these books about like the chemistry of memory in our brain. Mm -hmm. And because there are, how to say, the, how to say in English, like how the science sees memory change dramatically like from the 70s to now. Right. So I feel like, uh, so rather than researching for a story, I then I just read because I like it and then yep. write something out of it. Ah, interesting. Thank you, Norman. Um, unfortunately, I know there was another question there, but we have come to the end. And um, first of all, I just want to really express to you how brilliant these three books are. Like, I really want you to go up and buy them because they're just so good. And also, I'd like us all to thank Norman, Laura and Sequoia for being with us today. Thank you, Miranda. And Miranda. <laughs> <laughs>